Normally the end of a game is when the crazy stuff stops happening, but some games save some extra special stuff for after the credits roll. Hi folks, it's Falcon and today on Game Ranks, 10 of the craziest things that happened after the game ended, part two. Now part two implies there is a part one and this is true. And of course, before we get into this list, this is about the endings and things that happen after the endings of games. So expect spoilers, but getting started with no Number 10, in Red Dead Redemption 2, when you play as John Marston again. We mentioned Red Dead 1 on the first list, so for part two, we gotta come back with one of the best part twos of all time. RDR 2 is a prequel to the first game and follows the misadventures of the Dutch Vanderlyn gang as they try to outrun the law and stay alive in a rapidly changing world. The protagonist of the original game, John Marston, is in the game, but mostly he's just around. The guy you actually play as is Arthur Morgan, and RDR 2 is not a short game, so you play as Arthur a lot. So there's five lengthy sections of the story where you play as Arthur. It's so long that I just assume Rockstar wouldn't be putting anything else after the end, but obviously it's on this list, so I was not right about that. At this point, it's much less of a surprise because the game's been out a while, we've all played it, but at the end of the game, you can decide how honorable or dishonorable Arthur's final moments are, but the final result is always the same. Arthur dies and John Marston it manages to escape. It feels like a pretty definitive end to things, and for most games, the story probably would just end there, but no, it keeps going. The game jumps ahead multiple years, and now we're back playing as John Marston. Like the epilogue chapter of the original game, these last bits are a little more mellow, showing John try to rebuild his relationship with his family and prove to them he's a changed man from his outlawed days. It's actually an amazing section of an already great game and only deepens the themes of the story, and it also feels good to be back in John Marston's boots for a while. And number nine is Guardians of the Galaxy's Final Boss, a more recent example of a game that pulls a pretty fast one on you. Like they really, really want you to think that this game is ending. Like there's a final boss, sequence where all the heroes struck away and talked to their buddies, and it really feels like that's the end. They roll the credits, there's even a mid credit scene before cutting back to the credits that looks like there's set up to be a sequel. So it really feels like the game could be ending here. It's kind of unsatisfying that you never got to fight the actual bad guy of the game, Magus, but this is video games we're talking about. Most video game endings aren't great and usually are kind of sudden, so we just assumed that all this stuff would get followed up on a potential sequel. Thankfully, the game doesn't let us down. Magus shows up in the second mid-credits trailer, which leads to the actual final boss of the game, and it is appropriately epic. The only reason this whole thing isn't higher on the list is because it's not totally unexpected. I mean, the bad guy's whole thing is that he can warp reality reality and trick people with visions and stuff, so the audience is kind of conditioned to expect the unexpected. So savvy players probably saw this one coming, but we were impressed at least. Guardians turned out to be a surprisingly great game with a really fun last minute twist. And number eight is Dead Space 2's Rescue, one that really could have gone in our first list. Dead Space 2 is in many ways the aliens of video games. It's a more action-packed sequel that expands the original while still retaining what made the original so great. It's just a really fun, scary game with a lot of great moments, and this one's obviously included on there. At first, it seems like the game's gonna end on a downer. Isaac's able to resist control of the marker and destroy it, but it seems like he's going to die with the station. Isaac sits down, the screen fades to black while the computer voice is saying the entire facility is falling apart. It's a very horror game kind of ending that could have easily been how things concluded and even starts rolling credits to really make you think that's the end until out of nowhere Isaac's video screen turns on and reveals that Ellie is coming to rescue you. So you get in the ship and everything seems cool but they actually hit you with a double fake out as Isaac sits in a chair a lot like the ending of the first Dead Space. If you remember that game ends with Isaac sitting in the escape pod and then suddenly getting attacked by a necromorph. It looks like the exact same thing's gonna play out again here, but when Isaac looks over, he just sees Ellie, who just looks back and says, what? As unrelentingly grim as these games can be, the fact Dead Space 2 has a pretty happy ending almost feels like a subversion, but after everything the poor dude went through, it was nice they gave Isaac a little bit of a break with this ending. 
And number seven is Resident Evil 8's Flash Forward, a really unexpected thing from the game for multiple reasons. For one, Resident Evil games almost always have short endings where the heroes fly away on a helicopter and then fade to credits. It's practically a serious tradition that the ending's pretty short and simple. It's just something that happens in pretty much every one of the games. And it's basically how this one ends too. Um, Chris Redfield and Mia and the baby escape on a helicopter while Ethan Winters sacrifices himself to save the day. There's even a little tease that Chris is going to the European BSAA headquarters to deal with them, which implies there will be a sequel with Chris fighting his former organization. That's pretty normal, the stuff you'd expect from a Resident Evil game, but then the credits play and there's a post credit scene that sort of blows everything up. The actual scene itself is relatively mundane, but the implications for the series are pretty huge. It shows a teenage Rose visiting her father's grave, getting picked up by a guy who apparently works for Chris. They imply that Rose has some kind of powers and that she's needed for a situation, and then the car drives away to show a figure in the distance who's presumably an actually alive Ethan Winters. All of this wouldn't be that huge if this was a standalone game, but it's not. It's the eighth game in a major franchise, and there's never been a time skip as huge as this one in a Resident Evil game. Remember the last time we saw Rose, she was a literal baby, so it has to be at least 12 to 15 years from the rest of the ending. Like, what's the state of the world now? Why did they tease two completely different and sequels at the end. It's all kind of nuts, especially if you're a Resident Evil fan and love the speculation. At number six, uh, Neo 2, in that it is a prequel and a sequel. Neo 2 is an incredibly long game, especially for an action game. So when you take on a two-stage boss, it, it basically in every way looks like the last boss. Most people think that's the end. The plot's simple. You start out friends with Tokichiro and both rise up the ranks and gain prestige, but Tokichiro becomes evil and you have to fight him. So it makes sense that this would be the final battle. The encounter with him is pretty tough too. He's got the same yokai powers you do. There's even a surprise villain reveal where you find out that this evil spirit guy is the one who is influencing your friend to be bad. So you beat him down too and it's revealed that his evil is so powerful that you have to seal yourself in with him to keep the spirit contained. It seems like an obvious stopping point but no the game just keeps going. In a pretty cool twist it's revealed here that this game is both a prequel and a sequel to the original Neo. It never seemed like the original protagonist William would appear in the game but here he is and you actually have to fight him as as the next boss. Of course, then the two of them team up to take on the actual Honest to God final boss, Otaki Maru, and then the game actually ends. They never even hinted that something like this would happen. Pre-release Team Ninja swore up and down the game was just a prequel and had nothing to do with the first game, story-wise at least, so they completely lied about that, but it made the ending a really big surprise. Yep, nobody really cares too in-depth about the story in these games, but a William boss fight was pretty darn cool. And number five, with Metal Gear Solid 5, that there is just a part two of the game. Like, this is an obvious addition. There's a point in this game where it really seems like everything's wrapping up. You take on this game's Metal Gear, you kill the bad guy, everyone goes home happy, the credits roll. That's it, job well done. And then at the end, there's something completely different. A trailer for part two. Most Metal Gear games love to hide twists after the credits. It's a common thing for there to be some kind of phone message or conversation after the end credits where a big bombshells dropped that either hints towards a sequel or makes you rethink everything that's already happened. This game does something different. The credits roll, but there's still a ton of story left. Some of the most interesting parts of the game actually happen in part two. It's really where the entire structure of the game kind of gets blown up and not everything works. Um, just having to replay certain missions over again on hard difficulties is a drag and the whole thing kind of feels incomplete, but just the fact that there's so much more of the game past where a Metal Gear traditionally ends was kind of shocking. Regardless of your opinion of the rest of the game, the trailer that played after the credits was mind-blowing in the best possible way. And number four, Call of Duty Black Ops 2's Avenging Sevenfold. Call of Duty Black Ops 2 has a more silly one where Menendez and Woods join Avenge Sevenfold to play for a crowd consisting primarily of every other character to show up across the game. Also, Woods isn't actually handicapped. He's just apparently lazy. Like, uh, let's explain. This one's a lot goofier. So Call of Duty Black Ops 2's campaign was a pretty interesting experiment for the franchise. Instead of being totally linear, 
there were multiple choices that would affect the outcome of the story. It, like, it's an idea that they've only tried again, even kind of, with Cold War. But we'd love to see the franchise really try this choose-your-own-adventure idea in a future game again. The plot takes place in the future of the Black Ops universe, and it's about hunting a terrorist leader named Raul Menendez. None of that really matters for this whole thing, though. In fact, nothing matters for this. It's just an all-around really dumb thing that Treyarch put at the end of the game for, honestly, I have no idea. I don't know why this is in the game. Depending on your end, this goofy little bonus thing may come after either one or both characters featured die an agonizing death, so the tonal whiplash is completely insane. It's all inappropriate, dumb, totally pointless, and to some, painfully cringe. But it's also definitely surprising. I mean, why would a Call of Duty game end with a concert? And number three is the funeral in Wild Arms. We've mostly been talking about modern games on this list so far, but for this one, let's go all the way back to 1996 and the PlayStation 1. The original Wild Arms was pretty much overshadowed by the much more technically impressive and modern Final Fantasy VII, but it's a cult classic game for a reason. If you get past the pretty ugly 3D models in battle, you've got an old school RPG with a really good story and fantastic pixel art on top of an amazing soundtrack. One interesting gimmick about the game was that after you picked one of the three protagonists at the start of the game, you would play through each of their stories individually before they all met up and finally started the game properly. That let the game focus on each character's special gimmicks and give them some character before the actual plot kicked in, and it worked pretty well. Once all three characters are united, you get sent on a mission to discover some ancient technology, and when you return to town, it gets attacked by demons. The heroes lose the fight against the demon leader, the king is killed, and that seems like it's the end of the game. Looking at it now, it's absurd to think that an RPG would end that quickly, but a lot of players legitimately assumed that was the end of the game. It's a long sequence with swelling music that shows the funeral of the king in the aftermath of the battle that really does feel like something you would show at the end of the game, but it's really the beginning of the game. It was way more of a wild west with video games back then, so nobody really knew what a game might do. The PlayStation 1 was a system with a lot of weird games too, so if you just rented this one without any prior experience, I could definitely see why you'd think the funeral is the end, especially when the credits start kicking in. Games really didn't just do stuff like that back then. And number two is Advent Rising. Um, I don't know how to describe this without spending a longer period of time on it. So here, if you've heard about this game, it's probably in relation to how much of a bomb it was. Like it was an infamous failure, a janky, buggy mess that was awkward to play and had a borderline incomprehensible story. I can't even begin to describe what's supposed to be happening in this game. You play as this strange noodle creature that's apparently a human being and you fight forearmed elites from Halo and that's the game, but while most of it is weird and kind of dumb, it's not really noteworthy, at least until the ending. At the end of the game, you manage to defeat the bad guys, called the Seekers, then make it to the Galactic Council, basically the tattle on the bad guys. The credits roll from there, and that seems like the end. It's kind of weird and unsatisfying, but it fits with the rest of the game. Then, suddenly, the game cuts back to the Council, and this weird dude floats in, and says that they're a true human, and you end up fighting them. Guardians of the Galaxy didn't invent the surprise boss after the credits this game did there's probably something older than both of these that does the same trick but anyway you fight the guy with psychic powers and then you go through a portal and some weirdo uh, this guy with horns tells you that there is much to be done so basically all the most interesting stuff about this game happens after the credits and guess what it's not going to be followed up on and that's fine and finally, at number one, Dragon's Dogma's Everfall. You'd think a game called Dragon's Dogma would end when you killed the dragon, but no. The entire game seems to be about hunting a big dragon. Everything in the story tells you the dragon's the focus, and there's pretty much zero hints there could be anything else going on. So when you finally take on the big guy in the suitably epic final showdown, that feels like the end of the game. But in one of the most unexpected and crazy twists of all time, defeating the dragon causes a giant hole to appear in the capital city called the Everfall. And to truly finish the game, you need to go down to the depths of the place and take on the real final boss. Like I said, there's really nothing that hinted this could happen. It's a game mostly about wandering around an open world finding monsters, but the end of the game has you go to a pretty closed off dungeon and fight a god or whatever this is supposed to be. It's sharp right turn for a game that's pretty traditional fantasy stuff for most of it. A lot of JRPGs get weird at the end, and it's one of those things people kind of come to expect, but there's no way people would have expected 
expected that you'd have to fight and then become a god at the end of Dragon's Dogma. And remember, this is pre-Dark Souls, so it was a pretty novel idea at the time, at least for games like this. Everything about the Dragon Boss screams this is the final boss, so there being a lot more past it is just a huge shock. And that's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. The best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. So click subscribe. Don't forget to enable all notifications. And as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at Falcon the Hero, and we'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.